Amen. Well, it's, it's a joy to be back in the pulpit this morning. We certainly missed being with y'all last Sunday, but we had a great time with my family in the North Georgia mountains. I will tell you, we woke up Saturday morning, it was 59 degrees, so we thought about you. Um, <laughs> um, I want to congratulate, we have two families in our church that we want to congratulate. Uh, Joseph and Heather Castleberry had their uh, baby this week, and we congratulate them. And also, uh, Stephen is here uh, with his family as well, and we congratulate you, Stephen. Stephen, tell us the baby's name. All right. Well, he is a uh, he is a handsome young man, and I see he's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He's he's ready. So, congratulations. All right, well this morning we go to back to the Gospel of Matthew. As you know, we are, we are studying through the Gospel of Matthew. We're just going verse by verse, line upon line. And last uh, two weeks ago, we were in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And today we pick up in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. I'm going to start in verse 1 again. The Bible says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that in your marvelous grace you have given us the scriptures. And we know that the scriptures are sufficient for life and godliness. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use your word this morning to penetrate deeply into our hearts. Lord, give us ears to hear your word this morning and eyes to see the truth that you have for us. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use your word to apply it to our hearts so that we can be the people that you have created us and called us to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> I was reading a rather interesting article this week. It was out of the Huffington Post. And the title was, 45 Ways to Be Instantly Happier. 45 ways to be instantly happier. Now, I've got good news this morning. I'm not going to give you all 45 of them. But I did pick out some of them that I thought you might appreciate. If you want to be instantly happier, according to the, uh, to the author of this article, first thing you need to do is log some time with your furry friends. Secondly, remind yourself how great you are. That'll make you happier. Now, you're going to like this one. If you want to be happier instantly, not only do you need to listen to music, but listen to sad music. Say so researchers say that it helps to boost positive feelings when you listen to sad music. According to the article, if you want to be happier, hang out with happy people. If you want to be happier, fake a smile. If you want to be happier, drink milk. They tell us that milk contains amino acids that make serotonin, which is considered the happy chemical. If you, hey, you're going to like this one. If you want to be happier, embrace the aging process. Just embrace it. If you want to be happier, have a good cry. If you want to be happier, spend money, but spend it on somebody else. If you want to be happier, take a selfie. And finally, if you want to be happier, take a good nap. Just don't do it right now. <laughs> 45 ways to be instantly happier. But Jesus tells us in our text today the secret to happiness. We're in the Beatitudes. Now remember, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is the most famous sermon of all the sermons that Jesus preached, and he begins with the Beatitudes. And uh, the last time that we met, we were at the first Beatitude, Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now we come to, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, you remember that I told you that word blessed could also be translated happy. 
So today we see the secret to happiness is mourning. Happy are the sad. Happy are they who mourn over their sin, for they shall be comforted. Now the Beatitudes, just as a, as a review, the Beatitudes describe the character, these are character traits of all true believers. And he gives us the reward for each one of these Beatitudes. Who is truly happy? These are the ones who have true happiness. Now, happiness is not like we think of happiness. But happiness, biblically speaking, is a state of well-being or joy that comes from knowing that you are in right relationship with God. That's how to be truly happy. Now, there's eight Beatitudes that we're going to find. We're gonna, again, we're just going over each of them individually. And what we're going to see is that they build on one another. Um, and these describe, now this is so important for us to understand, these, these Beatitudes describe the essential character of all true believers. These are not describing super Christians, you know, the, the super spiritual Christians. These Beatitudes are, are characteristics of all believers. So to some extent, if you're truly a believer in Jesus Christ, these will be present in your life. And I emphasize to some extent. We're all different, but to some extent, all these things that Jesus says will be, will be a characteristic of your life. Um, none of these come naturally. We don't naturally become poor in spirit. We don't naturally mourn over, their, over our sin. All of these things are produced by a gracious working of the Holy Spirit in the heart. He is the one that works these things into the heart of believers. We don't get these, we don't, we're, we're not naturally born with these. This comes through experiencing the second birth, regeneration. So the Beatitudes distinguish the character of of saved people from the character of lost people because we belong to two different kingdoms. People who are saved act different than people who are lost. And again, the second builds on the first. Again, just as a review, we, uh, two weeks ago, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of, God, uh, of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? That means that you have the understanding that you have nothing to offer God that can fix your, your, uh, your problem, and that is sin. You have nothing. You are spiritually unworthy of his forgiveness and grace. You can't do a thing to fix yourself spiritually. You are spiritually bankrupt. Therefore, you recognize that you are at the complete mercy and grace of God. It's a, it's, uh, you, could, you could say it's humility, acknowledging that outside of God's grace, you are nothing. Nothing merits his forgiveness. Nothing merits his grace. Now, Jesus says, true disciples mourn over what put them in that condition in the first place. Why are we spiritually bankrupt? Because we are sinners. So that's where we're going to be looking at today. Blessed are those, or happy are those, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, three, three uh, divisions. If you're, if you're taking notes today, we're going to look, first of all, at the reality of godly sorrow, the reality of gar godly sorrow. And then we're going to look at the reward of godly sorrow. And then we will conclude with the roadblocks to godly sorrow. Okay, so that's, that's the direction we're, we're going today. So first of all, let's talk about the reality of godly sorrow. The reality is, reality is, is that true Christians mourn over sin. True Christians mourn over sin. So what does it mean in reality to mourn as Jesus says here? What is he talking about when he says, blessed or happy are those who mourn over sin. What does it actually mean to mourn? Uh, 
Now the word that is used here in the original Greek, of course the Greek uh, New Testament, for the New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic. So in the original Greek, that word mourn, it's the strongest word in the Greek language used to talk about this issue of mourning. It's, it's a, it's, it has the idea of having deep sorrow of heart that leads to repentance. It's the same word that is used in Genesis chapter 37, verse 34, where the Bible says, Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. So again, it's a, it's a deep sorrow of the heart. Now, we know that there are different kinds of mourning. There is what I would call a worldly or a common sorrow. This is the type of sorrow that, uh, that is produced by, by death. Abraham wept at the death of his wife, Sarah. Sorrow that, is, that comes from difficulty or, or when you face deep disappointment, you, you may sorrow or you may mourn over loneliness. There is the sorrow or mourning of getting caught. If you get busted doing something, there may be sorrow there. Second Corinthians tells us that there is a worldly sorrow. It's, 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 it's um, being remorseful over the fact that you're caught and that there's consequences that you are now facing because you've been, you've been busted, if you, if you will. That would be the sorrow of Judas Iscariot. His sorrow was not a sorrow that led to repentance but it was a sorrow of the fact that he had been caught and that there were consequences. And of course, there's also the misleading sorrow. That's the sorrow of the Pharisees. They, they would walk around with sad faces. It was an external thing, but it was not true sorrow. It was, a hypo, it was, hypo, it was hypocrisy. There was nothing going on inwardly because they were filled with pride. So the sorrow that he is talking about here is not a common or worldly sorrow, but it is a, a godly sorrow. It is a deep sorrow that mourns over sin. Again, this comes through the working of the Holy Spirit in the heart of an individual. We cannot produce this kind of sorrow in our own natural abilities. This is something that the Holy Spirit must bring to the heart of an individual. So one who wants to be truly saved will manifest this kind of sorrow. You cannot be saved until you truly mourn your sin. It is also the same, the same kind of sorrow that will characterize a believer in the hearts of those who are already saved. Now, of course, we know as believers there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. We know that we have been saved from our sins. Praise God. But in the heart of a true believer, according to Jesus, even when we sin, we don't celebrate. It bothers us. We mourn. We weep over our sins. So that is the kind of sorrow that Jesus is talking about here. Now, just a few examples in Scripture, what we're talking about here. First of all, we look to the Lord himself. In Luke chapter 19, verse 41, it says, and when he drew near and saw the city, he's talking about Jerusalem, he wept over it. Why did he weep over Jerusalem? Because he saw the effects of sin and all the, the hardness and the rejection of the people's heart because of sin. He, he mourned over the people's sin. Luke 18, verse 13, And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his, pre his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There is a tax collector. He goes to the, to the temple to pray, and he's so sorrowful over his sin that he can't even look up to God. And then, of course, Peter, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 75, says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Was Peter weeping bitterly because he had been caught? No, he was weeping bitterly over his sin. 
he was sorrowing over his sin. And by the way, at this time in Peter's life, he is a believer. He is saved at this point in his life. But yet he's mourning, he's weeping over his sin. And then in Romans chapter 7, which we're not going to turn there, but many of us are familiar with Paul and that struggle that he shares. He says, you know, there are things that I know as a believer I should be doing, and I don't do those things, but I do the very things that I don't want to do. He mourned over his sin. So that is, a, that is an example or examples of godly sorrow, what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about just being sad. Just being sad will not merit you salvation. Again, it's sorrowing, being mournful over your sin. Now, just several things that I want to mention about godly sorrow. Number one, godly sorrow comes from being poor in spirit. Again, when you, when you through working the Holy Spirit, accept that you are spiritually bankrupt, you respond in remorse because, again, you know that you are spiritually bankrupt because you are a sinner. So you mourn over your sin. Godly sorrow, number two, hates personal sin. You have, a, a, again, we, we know as believers we're, we're no longer condemned, but yet we still have this sorrow when we sin. And again, it's not just an external grief, it's an internal grief. And why is it, as a child of God, we should grieve over our sin? Because we know that our sin is against God. So therefore, it saddens us when we personally sin. Now, I want us to turn all to all of us to chapter or Psalm chapter 51 for just a few moments. Probably one of the, the most beautiful pictures in all of Scripture of an individual, of a child of God who mourns over their sin is David. David. We know that David had sinned with Bathsheba. And he went a year and his heart was hardened. And then God in his mercy and grace sent David a messenger in the life of Nathan. And Nathan calls David out. He calls his sin out. And then the Spirit of God brings conviction to David's heart. And just listen to David's words in Psalm 51, starting in verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, as we continue reading, I want you to listen how David takes ownership of his sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. All right. So there you see a beautiful Old Testament illustration of exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Here is David. He was a man after God's own heart, but yet he is mourning over his personal sin. So godly sorrow hates personal sin. Number three, godly sorrow leads to repentance. When you mourn over your sin, it leads to repentance. Now remember, repentance is not just confessing sin. Repentance is turning away from sin. So it's, 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 it's a change. If you mourn over, over the sin of whatever, maybe it's just, uh, you know, you realize the Holy Spirit has begun to convict you of your negativity. I mean, you're just negative about everything. And when people, you know, when they're around you, they leave, they're just completely drained because you're so negative all right and then the Spirit of God gets a hold of your heart and you're convicted over your sin of negativity and you begin to mourn over your sin and so therefore you repent that means you stop being negative okay so godly sorrow leads to repentance number four godly sorrow runs to Jesus godly sorrow runs to Jesus when you mourn over your sin you recognize that your sin is against God. There's nothing that you can do to fix your sin. The only solution to your sin is Jesus. 
So that's why a godly sorrow is necessary for salvation, because until you get broken over your sin, you'll never run to the solution for your sin, Jesus Christ. Number five, godly sorrow brings forgiveness, because when we run to Jesus, then we experience forgiveness. Number six, godly sorrow hates sin not only in yourself, but you hate sin in others. Now, I'm not talking about, this is not, this is not saying that we become self-righteous, judgmental Pharisees, that we look down our spiritual noses at other people. This is talking about having a true brokenness over another sin because you see that they are, number one, sinning against God, but also they're harming themselves. Psalm 119, verse 136 Rivers of water run down from my eyes because men do not keep your law. So, so to be broken, to mourn over sin, means that you mourn over the sin of others. So, so as Christians, again, not self-righteously, but as Christians, it should grieve our heart when we look at the world and we see the sin that is in the world. Amen? Does it grieve your heart when you turn on the news and you see the things that are happening in our society? I hope that it does. All right? Number seven, godly sorrow never stops. And what I mean by that is godly sorrow is necessary for salvation. You can't be saved until you truly mourn over your sin, until you're broken over your sin. But even after you're saved... There is this continual sorrow in the heart of a true believer. You never stop mourning over your sins. That is why Jesus, in the model prayer, and he's talking to believers, and we'll talk about this, that prayer because it's in the Sermon on the Mount, but he says to disciples that we are to daily confess our sins to God. So this process of mourning sin, it never stops. You see, the more that you grow in your relationship with Christ, the more that you see about yourself and the more that you see, the more that you want to confess to God. Because the closer you grow to the light, the brighter the light manifests, manifests areas of, of, of sin in your life. And so the closer you grow to Christ, yes, the deeper your understanding of forgiveness becomes, but the deeper your concern for personal sin becomes because the more that you love God, the less you want to hurt God by sinning against Him. You see, the world says, don't be too hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. But the closer you grow to Him, the harder you will be on yourself. Now again, we all know, praise God, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But the mark of, of true Christian maturity is not sinlessness, but it's a growing sensitivity towards sin. The mature you become in your Christian walk, the more sensitive you will become towards your own sin. All right? So that is the reality of godly sorrow. Number two. Let's talk about the reward of godly sorrow. He gives us the reward. What is the reward to those who mourn over sin? Well, the second half of the verse says, For they shall be comforted. So what is the reward? What do we get by mourning over sin? He says, They shall be comforted. That is the Greek word parakaleo. That, that, is, the, that is another word that means to come alongside, to, to, to encourage or to comfort. So when you are saved, after you have mourned over your sin, you've run to Jesus as your only source of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you and He brings a comfort to you. That, that comfort uh, says that that the sin that you are mourning has been dealt with. In essence, the Holy Spirit whispers into your ear that yes, your sin is ugly and vile, but Christ died and paid for your sin 
debt, and therefore you have received forgiveness. Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. You know, there is such a, a release, even as, as children of God, there's such a release when we mourn over our sin. And when we go to the Lord and we seek His forgiveness. Forgiveness is truly the greatest medicine for the soul. I, I say this often, but there are really only two types of people in the world. There's forgiven people and there's unforgiven people. And the only way that you can have true peace, true comfort in your soul is by knowing that you're forgiven by God. And sadly, most people in the world run to all kinds of different things to seek that comfort and that joy, but they want to bypass the only thing that will truly give them comfort. They want to bypass taking ownership of their sin. So the reward of godly sorrow is comfort, being comforted by the Holy Spirit. Number three, and finally, let's talk about the roadblocks to godly sorrow. The roadblocks to godly sorrow. I like this one quote. It says, there is too much laughing and not enough crying going on in the church today. When we look at the church today, and I don't mean just First Baptist Church, I mean just the church in general. Perhaps there's not enough mourning over sin today. And why is that? What are, what are the hindrances? What, what are those things that can keep us from experiencing godly sorrow? Well, I want to give you four of them. These are things that serve as a, as a roadblock that will keep us from, from even as, as Christians, from sorrowing mourning or sin. Number one, sin itself. Okay? When we have sin, when we're harboring sin in our hearts, sin blinds. That's what sin does. It blinds. It blinds us to the reality of our own sin. Now, sometimes we can be involved in some kind of repetitive sin, and we don't see it but it's obvious to others because sin blinds and it hardens our heart to the working of the Holy Spirit. So sin is the first roadblock to godly sorrow. Number two, the second roadblock to godly sorrow is a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding. A lack of understanding regarding sin itself. Sin, when we sin, we disregard God's law. We disregard God's honor. We disregard his reputation. We disregard his spirit. So there's a lack of understanding regarding sin, and there's a lack of understanding regarding the cross. When we sin, it should grieve our hearts because it is sin that put Christ on the cross. And so even those things that we say, well, just are little sins, it only took one little sin to put the Savior on the cross. So a lack of understanding sometimes is a roadblock to godly sorrow. A third roadblock to godly sorrow is presumption. We just presume upon God's grace. Well, you know, I, I know I messed up, but God forgives me. It's been taken care of. It's okay. That's presumption. And then fourth and finally, probably, probably the, one of the greatest things that in all of our hearts we, we struggle, we will have this fight until we, we die and go to glory as believers, and that is pride. Pride is the ultimate roadblock that keeps us from sorrowing over our sins. We say, well, I'm not that bad. I know that I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And so instead of confessing 
our sin. We find, we find ways to excuse and justify sin, which just is a testimony to sin itself. It is so blinding and it is so misleading that we are, so, listen church, outside of God's grace, our hearts are so depraved, we will find different ways to justify things that we do. And it ultimately is pride, and it is pride that will keep us from falling on our faces before God in, in, in brokenness over our sin. So those are the roadblocks to godly sorrow. Well, I don't know about you, but I have had the great joy in my life on more than one occasion of having an ingrown toenail. Has anybody ever had that blessing before? Maybe you are here today and you have an ingrown toenail. Well, the last time I had an ingrown toenail, I found that that toe was very, very sensitive. And so, because it is so sensitive, you go to great lengths to protect that toe. The last thing you want to do if you have an ingrown toenail is to ram that toe into the foot of your bed because it is sensitive. And if it's bad enough, you don't even have to touch it. Just looking at it, you'll, you'll, you'll feel like your toe is like a big toe in an old cartoon and it just looks like it's just doing like that, you know. Sensitive. Let me ask you this question this morning in closing. Are you sensitive to sin this morning? That's the challenge that his word gives us today. Are you sin sensitive this morning? Do you acknowledge your sin? Or do you find crafty ways to excuse it and justify it? Do you hate your sin, not only in yourself, but you hate sin in others? Or do you toy with sin? Do you entertain sin? Do you tolerate sin? Do you confess and repent? Is that a practice of your life? Even as a believer, do you look at your life and you see in your life that there is this, this pattern of confession and repentance in your life? Or do you seek to try to keep your sin covered? I close with this, James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. God gives grace to the humble. Are you willing to be humble this morning? You know what? According to Jesus, there's only one true way to be happy. But it's a difficult way. It's a way of humility. we got to be willing to be broken over our sin. Because until we're broken over our sin, we won't run to the Savior. And until we run to the Savior, we won't experience forgiveness. And if you don't have forgiveness, you'll never truly experience true happiness. Well, let us pray. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the challenge of your word. Lord Jesus, we... We thank you for your grace that makes all of this possible. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here today and they're lost, oh, maybe from the world's perspective, they're good people, they're moral people, they're religious people, but they've never truly mourned over their sin. Therefore, they've never truly run to Christ to seek his forgiveness and salvation. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that today... You would awaken their hearts and their minds to the reality of their need for forgiveness and that you would show them that there is only one way to be forgiven and that is through Christ. Would you save them today? And then for those of us who are saved,
Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that when you died on the cross, you paid our sin debt for every single one of our sins, and all of our sin has been taken care of. But, oh, Lord Jesus, as your children, when we sin, oh, God, we pray that we would mourn over our sin because we know that our sin is against you and ultimately you alone. May it break our hearts when we do anything that is dishonoring to you. Father, may we be a people who daily confess, daily repent of our sins so that we can experience the comfort that comes from the Holy Spirit. Lord, we give you this time of invitation. We pray, Holy Spirit, that we would be obedient to your voice this morning. May we not have rest until we do what you lead us to do. Maybe it's simply we need to come to the altars and maybe there's a person on our heart that we have a burden for. We love them dearly, but their eyes have not been opened to the reality of their sin and we just want to cry out on their behalf to you. Lord, maybe there's a burden, maybe there's something that we're struggling with and it has nothing to do with what, what your word talked about today directly, but Lord, we just want to come and pour our hearts out to you. May we feel the liberty to do whatever it is that you're leading us to do as we respond. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. And we thank you that we can have true happiness through Christ. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.